Okay, go ahead. Okay. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, this meeting will be live streamed, recorded, and available on the internet by visiting the county's website at www.thecounty.ca. This meeting will be conducted as a virtual electronic meeting in accordance with the county's procedural bylaw. So, the, uh, <clears throat> welcome uh, everybody. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the confirmation of the agenda. Um, and uh, can I have a mover uh, and a seconder for the getting the agenda on? Thank you. Uh, is that Michael? Our John will second. Yes. And our John seconds it. Thank you. So, all in favor? All right, good, thank you. Um, so we'll move forward uh, to the disclosure of the uh, any pecuniary interest or general nature thereof. Will you indicate any now? Seeing none, then we'll move along. Minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, so they were circulated. Um, and um, can I have um, the a motion to uh, uh, approve those minutes or adopt those minutes as as, per, as circulated. Thank you, Arjun, and Councillor Hurst will second. And everybody's in favor of that. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. <laughs> Any announcements, uh, Jen? That uh, that is up to members. If any member would like to make an announcement, oh. uh, yep. they can do it under this section. Okay, so, seeing I don't see anybody's hands up there. All right, so then um, we will um, we have two deputations I see, and our is uh, Cheryl Anderson from the South Shore Joint Initiative is um, going to pr present an update on their initiative. I think is she ready to roll, Jen? She's just connecting now. She's okay. coming in from the waiting room. I see her now. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, I'm in. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Welcome, uh, Cheryl. So you're going to do a, an update for us on the uh, uh, progress of the uh, South Shore uh, South Joint Initiative on the Hydrant House. Yes, I am. Okay. So yeah, you're ready to go start. We can start. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yes, I wanted to talk to you again this morning about uh, the Hudgen House and just let you know what is happening. And so um, just uh, to go through it again, the Hudgen House is owned by Nature Conservancy Canada. They purchased it in 2017. Um, the house did get its heritage designation in 2011. And um, in 2017, South Shore Joint Initiative was given tenancy of the house and established the uh, Moses Hudgen Log House Restoration Committee <laughs> 2018. And so just uh, to uh, go through this again, it's on Ostrander Point Road. And here's a map of where it is. If you can kind of see, this is Babylon Road along here. And the house is about halfway down before Ostrander Point Road makes a right hand uh, or left hand turn, uh, depending on which direction you're going. And um, when we took over the house, uh, that's what it looked like. Hopefully uh, you can you can see that. Um, the house is a heritage house and it represents the, the Hudgens family resi resilience that lived there in the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, members of the Hudgen family actually lived in the house until 1967. And um, also there was Philip Hudgen that uh, was uh, the lighthouse keeper at Point Travers. So the house <clears throat> represents a lot of South Shore heritage. So we have goals for the Hudgen Log House was, the first goal was to stabilize the structure and um, restore all the uh, key building components. Uh, we want to, as our medium term goal, work on the inside of the house and uh, get 
things in place for accessibility and uh, for to use it for public use. And as a long-term goal, we are doing planning for our programs and, um, and the lease with Nature Conservancy Canada. The picture shows you what the house looks like now. Um, the shutters on the on the on the lower floor will be replaced with much better shutters <laughs> this winter. So as far as the zoning goes, I believe that the zoning has been um, changed so that uh, we can use it for use the house for non-residential use that is meetings programs that kind of thing um, we need to uh, have an agreement with the municipality so that the parking along the side of the road actually it it goes a little bit closer to the road than what um, is normally agreed upon is normally allowed so we need to have that agreement um, we need a building permit for the interior upgrades, um, and we are working on that. That needs to be um, arranged with Nature Conservancy Canada, and we're waiting for them to uh, to do to make those agreements and arrangements. Um, we will be uh, doing all of the things inside that will provide universal access. So here's just uh, what we've done so far. Um, we did a complete heritage assessment in 2017. We raised money. Unfortunately, we couldn't start until 2022 for because of that reason that stopped everything. Um, we've had the logs stabilized and rechinked in, outside and inside. The windows constructed by um, excellent construction people in um uh, the Mennonites up in Western Ontario, and they they were installed on the ground floor and the hydro service was installed. Then this year, we've had the gable ends rebuilt, the upper story windows installed, the gym chimney rebuilt, and um, the window, lower windows frames and doors painted. So how have we paid for all of this? Uh, we've had a lot of grants and we've had also had um, uh, a very nice grant from the uh, John and Bernice Parrott Foundation. We have raised a lot of money through our sponsor, sponsor and patron fundraising program and uh, done a lot of other wow. smaller fundraising activities. So far we have raised $128,000. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today is we do have an outstanding uh, heritage property grant from the municipality, and that would be for the, the chimney. Um, I believe uh, that chimney grant should be about $5,000. All of the documents have gone into the planning department, but we don't have the money yet. So one of the reasons I'm talking to you today is to hopefully um, sort of facilitate uh, the payment of that grant. So the current cost of the restoration, we've spent about $65,000. We expect that we will be able to complete the restoration um, if we have $140,000. So as you remember from before, we have $128,000 raised already. So we're doing pretty well if we um, we include the amount we're going to need um, for the first year of operating, we need about another $20,000. So far, um, a conservative estimate of the in-kind contributions of um, all of the people who've been working on this um, is about $152,000. So how are we going to use, use the house? So start with just a Hudgen. So Laura Hudgen Edge has done an amazing amount of work on genealogy of the Hudgens and the use of the house over six generations of Hudgens that, that lived there. So 
she talked about education, uh, community engagement, um, environment, arts and culture. And I think education came up as a highlight for her. So this is what uh, what she wrote. So going through, we will use it as a gathering place. We'll have uh, events and as a gathering place for events in Water Point Conservation Reserve and also in uh, a gathering place uh, for use of the South Shore footpath that we're planning. Um, Nature Conservancy Canada has two uh, areas that are close to Monarch Point. One is the Hudgen Rose Nature Reserve that the Hudgen House is on, and the other one is the Maple Cross Coastline Reserve. And so we visualize it as being a place where people who are going to be doing bio biodiversity studies will be able to use that as a field house. We have uh, Wild Thing, which is our South Shore Joint Initiative education program. We visualize the house as being a center for education for elementary students. Our outdoor educator has devised a, a curriculum, uh, curriculum based program for both grade three and grade six. And she has given us a complete rundown of how she would run an education program at, at the Hudgen House. For culture, uh, Hudge House is a place where musicians can come and put on a presentation. Uh, it's close to um, the school, the music school on, uh, on the South Shore. And also a great place for artists to come if they want to do uh, plein air or any of those sorts of artistic things. So our vision, to put it all together, our vision for the future of the Hudgen House. It will be a social enterprise, a field center for exploring the South Shore, its assets, birds, creature, creatures and plants, a place to showcase and demonstrate heritage, uh, culture, quilts, wooden furniture and toys. It will reveal the fishing and farming history of Prince Edward County South Shore. It will be an outdoor education hub for elementary school, children, a stopping place for the South Shore footpath, a potential dark sky viewing place, a cultural base for artists and musicians, the central gateway to the South Shore, and an event and gathering place for county citizens and visitors. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, our John has a question. Go ahead. Yes, oh, go ahead, John. Through the yeah. chair, yes, through the chair. With all this work being done, quite amazing. Um, is there any like fire suppression concerns mm -hmm. like of that neck of the woods? Like, do you have fire extinguishers around to just in case something goes wrong? Of course. <laughs> okay, just curious. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, yes, yeah. Monica. Um, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. My apologies. Zoom decided I needed to be updated before I could get into the meeting. Um, Cheryl, the the fishing part of it, because it's a contemporary concern that's been expressed again. What? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your presentation. But what what does that entail? Basically, it's an educational um, part of what we plan to do there. Just to let people know about the commercial fishery that's existed on the South Shore for 200 years. And so we can visualize that we might have, say, a program where people would come and learn about the South Shore fishery. And is there, sorry, another question, follow up? Yes. Is there a, is there a linkage with the Marine Museum at all on that? That's we haven't made any any plans for that, um, and that would be a good thing to do. But we want to make sure that this is not a museum. Yeah. So maybe what would happen would be there would be a program that would bring in the experts 
from the Marine Museum to talk about the fishery at the Hudgen House. It's not, it's not intended in any way to be a museum. Thank no, you, Cheryl. Sure. Anyone else have some questions? No. No? All right. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Jen, we will need um, a motion, right, for uh, the, her, uh, Cheryl's presentation, uh, de a deputation be received. Thank you, John, for that. Seconder? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ross, thank you. So um, thank you for that. All in favor for the dep deputation to be received. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Cheryl. We'll see Great you again. Great to see you all. <laughs> we'll see you in the future, I bet. <laughs> yes. Merry Christmas, okay. everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So we have an, another deputation. Um, yes, Jen? Unfortunately, he was to do the deputation from the uh, clerk's office, but he hasn't shown up, so we'll have to move on. Okay. All right. So um, now presentations. We have uh, someone to do a presentation. Andrea Dawes from the Special Initiatives Manager of Prince Edward County's Art Council. Is she available? Oh. <laughs> She's connecting. There's Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> so, um, no, no, Andrea. There's Andrea. No, oh, is she there? Oh, there she is. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yes. So you have. You're going to do a presentation um, about the public um, art council planning process. That's public right. Public art planning process. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a mouthful. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for having having me here today and and Chris as well. Hi, Chris. Um, thank you for for letting us give you a little update on uh, on this process. We uh, visited your committee uh, back in June when uh, we were advocating for um, a public art planning process for, for Prince Edward County. And it ended up that um, council um, wanted us uh, at the Arts Council to, to run the process. So I'm the special initiatives manager at County Arts. Um, and so since we, we d dove deep right into community engagement, um, and have been running that process over the last couple of months. So today I just wanted to give you a little update on that and uh, touch on some, some things that I, I wanted to keep uh, the Built and Cultural Heritage Committee meeting in the loop about. Um, and so, yeah, so we, ha we had our Have Your Say uh, survey running over uh, two months from September to November. Um, and we did a bunch of engagement activities. We we did we led some public art walks, exploratory public art walks through uh, Picton and Wellington. Had um, you know, basically inviting the community to participate in that process and and explore and imagine what what uh, public art could look like in in those communities. Um, and I ran uh, we ran an artist focus group as well. And we're in deep in the stakeholder interview phase. We're basically halfway through, um, and you are a part of an uh, important part of that. Um, and I just wanted to mention also that coming out of the the motion that council passed in the summer, um, we were also tasked uh, to work with the municipality on developing um, some procedures and an application for temporary public art uh, on municipal property. Um, and so this in the past, ha there hasn't been a process uh, to go through to it's kind of been a bit more loose. Um, so we were helping them kind of put into to place procedures around that that is municipal property only. Um, but that process, we worked with um, the county's lawyer, Sarah Vio, and uh, developed some language around around to make sure it's, you know, meeting everybody's needs. Um, and also is is hopefully not too high of a barrier for artists and businesses to uh, to apply um, and organizations to apply mm -hmm. to temporarily install public art. Um, so we are um, just to give you a sense of what the potential outcomes of this process is, we are going to be returning 
um, next, you know, by Q4 2024 with a public art plan um, for, for Prince Edward County. And this would guide, help guide all decision making processes around public art, whether it's a commission that the municipality um, wants to uh, help fund or whether it's donations or community initiated uh, public art projects. So just helping to put a framework around a decision making framework around all of those things that is informed by all of the community engagement that we've done um, and that we'll continue to do over the next couple of months. So um, it could potentially lead to a small public art program where there's a small budget for a public art coordinator um, and potentially some funding through creative ways coming in for actual commissions. Um, and there could be a public art advisory committee that's kind of helping to guide, to implement the public art plan because we want to make sure that once the plan is in existence and in place, there is there is um, some, some resources to to make sure that it gets implemented in 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 a, in, a, in the correct way. Um, and so our job really, we're kind of you know understanding all of the different stakeholder needs um, that obviously public art is a very it's in public it's in our public realm art itself is very subjective so making sure there's um you know there's there are processes in place to make sure that as many people as possible needs are being met from you know the municipality making sure that safe and welcoming public space, you know, our public spaces are safe and welcoming for everyone, um, that artists have, you know, opportunities to create and have that freedom to create, um, that businesses who want to have uh, to help, you know, beautify their realm with public art have a kind of low barrier entry to being able to do that and a toolkit and um you know here's here's how you can make a project like that happen and of course the heritage committee making sure that um the buildings um, within the heritage conservation district are uh, protected and um and preserved um and so yeah so that is a quick update um there are we, I don't. I won't go go into it. There will be a community engagement report coming out hopefully this week um, to the public. So watch out for that. I can also share it with uh, with folks um, if they don't see it. But that'll give a little sense of of how the Have Your Say page kind of um, uh, shook out and where you know there where people want to see public art and what kinds and things like that. Um, so um, today I just wanted to give that update and also touch base a little bit on the guidelines for uh, murals and art installation for the Picton Heritage Conservation District properties. Um, I hope most are familiar with that document. It was passed by this committee um, in July. Um, and so when we spoke to you in June, we it was kind of agreed that that document would uh, be be a, a bit flexible to be incorporated into um, the public art policies and things that are coming out of this process based on the community engagement um, piece. Um, so going forward, just over the next you know few months, um, I would love to have uh, someone from your. I'm not sure who uh, drafted that document. Um, if there's someone that has a special interest in working on uh, you know refining those details um and and uh adjusting if need be that document uh for inclusion in in the public art you know plan and recommendations um that would be great for me to have someone so i don't don't have to like you know go through all of the the nitty-gritty with the committee with all of the committee um so yeah so just wanted to to throw that that question out um and as I mentioned in my little summary, which hopefully you have access to, um, should the process result in a in a public art program, generally um, kind of the art related aspects of um, of the of like a public art application would be addressed by a public art committee and the heritage aspects addressed by a heritage committee. So we kind of work together um, on that. So just to let you know, I'm. Kingston 
Um, the city of Kingston this summer uh, came out with a new um, murals on private property uh, kind of toolkit and process application process, um, which is interesting. They've had their public art plan and policy in place for many years, and they have a public art program rolling out. Um, but they felt the need to um, kind of have a little bit of a process around murals on private property um, that are in you know prominent public places because it is so much of our our public realm is private. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, the Heritage Conservation District in Picton and in the future in Wellington. Um, so making sure that there is a, you know, small process, it doesn't have to be very elaborate, but something to go through. So an idea that 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 we, you know, wanted to float was that mm -hmm. if we had a um, a process, an application process for um, murals and art um, in, you know, on private property that we could begin by kind of having that in the heritage conservation districts, um, maybe plural, plural, depending on what happens in Wellington. Um, and so that there would be kind of just kind of an assumption that those heritage conservation districts are kind of some of our more publicly um, accessible private spaces um, in, our, in our towns. Um, so yes, yeah, so lots of jargon, sorry. <laughs> um, but just from today, I wanted to kind of let you know where we're going with some of these, uh, the kinds of ideas that we're floating and and hopefully have someone that I can speak to in more detail um, going, you know, over the next couple of months to work out these little details. Um, yeah, I don't know, Chris, Chris, did you wanna mention anything else or? So thank you very much there, Andrea, um, for bringing us up to date on what you're doing. It uh, sounds very exciting and interesting. Um, do I have any questions for you from the committee? Yes, Councillor Hurst and then Monica. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, uh, Andrea, and, and thank you, Chris, for being here today, too. Um, I, I think this, having, having a, a public art policy is going to be more and more important as, um, as our communities grow. Um, we know the amount of growth that's predicted for the next uh, few years in you know both the Picton area and and Wellington area, and we must not forget that Wellington may we hope have an HCD um, around about the time in 2024 when you'll be kind of finalizing this policy. So that would be good timing. But something we all need to think about as a committee, and and uh, this comes to an issue that we've dealt with uh, on another agenda item, I guess. Is, is the question of enforceability of, of policies right now. I mean, the, the this mural uh, policy that we have, um, you know, asks people to uh, apply for a permit and get a permit. And this committee gets to say whether or not we think it's a good idea. But there is, uh, unfortunately, this whole concept of heritage permits and heritage conservation districts, there is no enforcement or penalty provision in provincial law and we have nothing yet in in local law. So something we as a committee may be wanting to pursue in the near future is the potential of creating a municipal bylaw that would actually um, put some teeth in this uh, in this permitting process. Because quite frankly, it's awful to say, but as, as things stand right now, um, if somebody puts up a, a kind of an offensive not even offensive, just an inappropriate kind of mural or outdoor art. There's no mechanism to 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 stop that if if people are determined to do that. So um, we really and and we have time. I mean, the good thing is, your one might say it's 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 too long to wait for almost a year to get this done. But I think it gives us all a chance to get um, all the different pieces in in place so that uh, so that it can work together and and be. Uh, be accepted and respected um, by the community. So, so good work, and and we're obviously going to follow this very closely. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hurst, uh, Monica, um, Andrea. If in the have your say process, was there? Do you know if there was much response from the rural villages communities? Yeah. So, um, so I, um, <laughs> I was very busy. 
in uh, September and October and and uh, went out to the Milford Fair, the Emilesburg Fair, um, chatting with people. I had kind of maps up where people had a map of Milford, map of Consecon, Emiliasburg. People could pin locations on the maps um, that they were, you know, they'd like to see in the in the smaller communities. Um, because of resources, we could only do the public art walks in, in two towns. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there was a, a good amount of effort. Um, the thing with public art, I mean, one, one kind of best practice is that you do want it to be in a place where the most people, at least larger projects, larger budget projects, you do want that to be in a place where the most number of people will see it. Um, so in that sense, you know, there could be for, for larger projects, um, you know, the, the larger centers might be prioritized, but lots of good ideas um, coming in in the smaller communities as well. So, and I feel like that will be helpful for, um, you know, the the, the smaller um, BI, like Consecon Ratepayers Association stuff to just kind of understand where people in their community would want to see public art. And maybe there's a project that could be spearheaded in, in some of the smaller communities. So that there was definitely, that was on our, on our priority list and radar. Um, so, uh, so yes. Did you have a, a specific question about um, a particular community or? Well, I guess maybe an observation that when we look at the policy around uh, uh, um, financing or budgeting or supporting projects or saying, yep, you can go ahead with that. Um, uh, the Bloomfield quilt went up about the same time that uh, Milford had the Miller on the seat and we also had some um, murals that were developed within the community, one of which is on the library. And um, and Janice Gibbons worked with a group of students. Now, those students are grown up, have children. That's how long ago that one was. And it's fatigued looking. Its mm -hmm. content is still lovely for the area, but it is fatigued. And and trying to figure out, and, and Barbara Sweet and I have talked about this that particular one over the years, is how do we... How do we update that one, not lose it, or how do we replace it or whatever? And uh, that's not my skill set, um, but it was great at the time. And we did that one and we did the one of the village, which is interesting because the youngest person painting was eight and our oldest person was like 80. So it was a multi-generational project that happened and and not all of it is, is a perfect proportion and stuff. I'm not an artist, but it's not perfect proportion. But it's fascinating for people to see, to see people stand there and look at that one and figure out, oh, that's what that was. And that's what that was. It's kind of a bit of a jigsaw puzzle in some respects. But again, that one faces and, and the uh, sign on Mount Tabor, it, yeah. um, it captures it was done with intention to capture history of the area. So um, I was just wondering in terms of what I guess really the the budget process or remembering there's a need to have that restoration piece of it built in. Exactly. Thank you, Monica, for mentioning that. And, and, you know, in a public art project budget, the, the recommendation is that 10% of the budget is set aside for maintenance. So there would be kind of a reserve um, to pull from um, because it's, it's so key and artists say it as well. Like, you know, artists put put investment into these processes as well and they want to know that it will be taken care of especially if it's on a municipal um property so so thank you for that um and uh and yeah that would be i think you know part of having a, a small like program and and resource to turn to when uh when you know library is like hmm like can we what do we do? Um, having so, having the program, you know, whether it's run by there's been it's the idea has been floated. It could be run by the Arts Council um, in collaboration with the municipality or within the municipality itself. Um, but whoever is running running the process um, that they they are a resource for community members um, that want to do these projects. And um, and I think there's so much talent in, in our area, as you know, like artistic talent. Um, that we can tap into. Um, so, so yes, thank you for that. Uh, I'll note, note that. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments or questions for Andrea? <laughs> Seeing none, then we will look forward to you coming back to us in the new year <laughs> with thank more you. information. Thank you. Is there someone I, I can? Communicate? Yes, Jen, just one second. Yes, Jen. 
Oh, you're on mute, Jen, and I don't can't hear you. Sorry. Through the chair to the committee, I thought, um, and this could be where Andrea was going, we may want to assign someone from the committee to work with the ounce Arts Council through the development of the policy. Um, um, and is there someone on the committee that could be her point of contact? I We don't have the f full committee here. So I, I uh, can we extend that and notice out that someone, we're looking for someone to go on that committee to see if anyone out that is not on the committee meeting today might be very interested in that project. Um, is that possible, Jen? I suppose you could, or you could appoint someone today. And then if someone who's not here is interested, maybe you switch out in the new year. And uh, because it would be good if there's someone here who's, who's willing yeah, to yes, do I, Yeah, if there's someone here uh, too, but I, I like the fairness of everybody knowing that there's this, this uh, position, because there may be somebody that didn't get to attend today that would really love to, to do it and has some background in it to, uh, so okay, I can put I it on the agenda tracker for the January yeah. meeting if you like. Yeah. Well, and and yes, okay. I think you're not going to be working 24 hours a day over Christmas, right, Andrea? Exactly. No, okay. <laughs> it would just be good to have that, you know, time yes. in the new year. Yeah. So I just like to reach out to all the committee to, in fairness, to everyone, mm -hmm. and um, um, and also the report that you said might be coming out this week. Can you circulate it to this committee? Uh, yeah. So that all of us can uh, read that and do our homework over the uh, uh, Christmas break in our leisure and, uh, um, and, and you know, really get understand what's going on and, and we can get back to you on a, a person for that committee. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. You're very welcome. So can I have a, a motion to uh, receive uh, Andrea's presentation? Yes, Monica. And seconder. Okay, our John. Thank you. So all in favor? Okay, good. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So Jen, um, does, did the presenter for the deputation turn up or? No, we can move on. Okay. All right. So comments from the audience. Do we have any comments from the audience, um, uh, Jen? No, we do not. Okay. So items for consideration, 9.1, updated master list of permits. Um, all right, master list of permits. Emily, you ready to roll? Yeah, uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, um, no additional permits to share at this time. Um, in speaking with Jen, she had she had mentioned that the committee was wondering about the status of the the bean counter who had submitted a permit for doors earlier. Um, so they have withdrawn that permit, and I'm not aware of any uh, plans to change the doors right now. Okay. Does uh, do any committee members have questions for Emily on the permits? No. All right. Thank you for that. Um, uh, that update and that that update. I need a motion for it to be received. Ross, I saw your hand up on the other one, so I, I thank you. Moving to that one. Second, seconder for this motion to receive Emily's oral report. Thank you, Michael. Oh, I'll, I'll get Monica next time. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Okay. Good. <clears throat> now. We're going to go into task teams, um, and I'm going to change the order of how we present uh, just a little bit. Heritage designation working group. I thought what I put first because I'm interested to hear how they've been doing since they have the the more uh, urgent timeline <clears throat> in our uh, in our working uh, work plan. How are how are things going with that group? Who's going to report back? <laughs> it's either John or myself, I guess. <clears throat> Michael, are you going to fill us in? Well, okay. Uh, we have met um, and we are working. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, well, yes, there's an urgent timeline. We've identified the, as you know, the, the list. We've had public meeting. We've sent out letters. We've received a number of responses and various committee members have undertaken to discuss 
with the respondents the next steps going forward, whether they want to designate or not. <clears throat> We've also identified impediments, as you may know, mm -hmm. that some people may have or concerns that people have, mm -hmm. um, such as uh, how does it affect their insurance, their resale value, uh, so forth. Uh, we are providing resources uh, to answer those questions for anyone who raises them mm -hmm. and to make those resources available uh, to the various people who've received letters. There's going to be a second letter going out uh, as a kind of reminder. One of the things you have to recognize is that I, I think we figured out that over half of the homes on the list are second homes. Their owners do not live in the county. Mm. And so communication isn't as quick as it might be if everyone was a county resident. Mm -hmm. uh, their, their sense of urgency or their interest in this may be somewhat less. Mm -hmm. So it will take further urging on our part, I guess, to get their attention and see if they wish to continue with the process. We have, I think, put forward four properties to council that are going to be part of a bylaw, which is going to be passed in December. I think that's right, is it, John? Yes, that's uh, true. There are four properties that are going to be added to the heritage list, the official designated list. Okay, good. Um, but it's going to be, uh, I think, probably a somewhat incomplete process because they say if half the homeowners don't live in the county, it's just a matter of attracting their attention and, you know, perhaps sparking their interest in the whole question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, yes, John, some more information. Yeah, I might just add, that was great, Michael. I'll just add maybe something about numbers, um, which should mm -hmm. interest people. So as of our last, the last working group meeting on November 27th, I guess, it looks to me like there were, in, in, in response to the letters that went out and some of the personal contacts that have been made by members of the working group with, with owners, um, there are 22 properties who are either definitely or, or possibly inclined to designation and 21 definite no's okay. <laughs> um, so far. Um, but as Michael said, there's there's ongoing discussions and, and we hear different kinds of stories. Some people say, well, I'd be interested in doing this, but not right now. I want to f I'm, I'm doing some renovations to the house. I'd like to finish that before um, considering uh, designation. And part of that may be um, a hidden feeling that they, they feel that their renovations might not be allowed if they pursue designation. We know that that's usually not the case, but some of these fears are hard to get over. As Michael said, some people have expressed concern about insurance, and we've been doing some work on getting better information out and contacting the uh, the uh, several insurance companies to be able to publish, you know, some better information about um, about how that works. So, um, the feeling is that that. At the end of the day, at the end of next year, however many we've gotten designated, well, they will be designated. Those left over automatically fall off the list. But we think there will probably be a reasonable number of folks who are still interested. And even though their property, from a legal standpoint, has had to fall off the list, the intention would be to keep in touch with them and to keep encouraging them uh, to designate. And this... This might be a, a, an ongoing function of this working group if it continues or an ongoing function of this committee, but certainly uh, certainly worth uh, pursuing and keeping the interest in, in heritage designation up. I'll just add one more thing too, that the Point Travers Lighthouse, um, the designation has been uh, uh, prepared for that and uh, is, is ready to go to council, but we elected not to put it forward to council as a one-off because that, that generates this advertising process, which is costly and so on. So it will it will happen with probably the next batch of several more homes um, uh, potentially in January. Okay, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, questions for uh, John or Michael? Uh, they're moving along, they're working hard. 
they're doing very um very good work in contacting people and it's a it's a hard it is a hard go um because of some of the myths out there about designation and so i'm glad you're preparing resource mater materials to uh, answer the questions of, of the public or house owners um and they will be available online i assume <laughs> jen and when they're ready so that you can go to the website and get some of your yeah. questions answered right there quickly okay we're we're hoping to have some publicity when the designations are passed this current group of designations mm -hmm. perhaps just to spark interest to have a, a photo opportunity for the press mm -hmm. and so forth just to uh keep up the momentum a little bit maybe yep yeah uh, keep, mm -hmm. keep it in the public eye yep. yep good all right no questions then for them all righty okay so um i'm going to go to the street naming task team next and they had a, a quite a full report uh, last time. They got all the names. They're working through them. I take it. Who can uh, respond? Jen, you're on that committee. <laughs> I can, if you'd like, through the chair to the committee. Um, right now, we're in the process of finalizing the list, and um, that includes getting consent forms for um, names that were submitted for individuals that are recognizable. We're not um, requiring consent forms if it's just a surname, um, but if it is a first and last name and the, the individual is identifiable, we're asking for consent forms. And if the, the person is living, we have them come and do a consent form and sign um, and have it commissioned by one of the clerks here for free. And if it's a deceased individual, a member of the family can provide a consent form. So just to make sure that the family's okay with it. And if the person's living, of course, we'd want them to know and be okay with it. Um, and then the next step is we decided, or I should say the task team decided that it would be appropriate to send the list to an Indigenous consultant to make sure that any of the names that we're providing are appropriate. Um, and then again, another layer is um, having a first response, review the list and make sure, you know, any notes that they have for us, that we receive that before we we give the list to the committee. So um, that's where we are in the process right now. We have 161 names on the list. 22 of those have outstanding consent forms. So we may remove those and um, could kind of keep them in our back pocket and, and perhaps family members will be able to give consent forms um, at a later date. But uh, whatever we provide to the committee and to council will have consent and will be reviewed by uh, an Indigenous consultant and or and the uh, first response. Good. Thank you. Any questions for Jen on that? Uh, Monica? Mm -hmm. um, to the chair. Jen, um, Many years ago, when 911 started, there was an attempt to uh, name roads in the county based on the longest people living on the road. That was one of the naming, street naming strategies back then. And a concern came up over um, where EMS covers, where our EMS covers a broader community. Is mm -hmm. there any limitation in terms of, of replicating a last name when when it might be already in Quinney West or it might be already in Belleville or it might be in Village of Maydock or someplace like that. And it was a concern. Well, perhaps we can. It was a concern that EMS raised in terms of not wanting people, not wanting an ambulance to end up on Bond Road, which happens to be here or mm -hmm. when it's sort of in another community as well. Right. Well, hopefully that would be something that the uh, when we have an EMS review it or first response review it, maybe they have access to the full GIS list of names. We as a task team and staff only have the list of uh, county names that are existing. And so we've checked everything against our own names, but not against other municipalities. So that's a good point. And we can when we um, engage that consultation, we can bring that up and have them double check that it, and it might be they already have their policy preference i don't think mm -hmm. they can create policy but but they might have a policy preference on it for sure 
or it might be a higher it might be a higher provincial authority relative to the EMS systems. Of course, there's gonna I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of cardinal streets around the province that just doesn't but within one well, cities yes. tend to have recurring street names often. Yes. It, do, it yes. does happen, but when you're close by you would want to make sure that it's clear. I, I understand that. Yeah. Thank you. I personally I would hope that the uh EMS people have um are using kind of like the Google search way because it that is really um you know, you'll get a list. If I went in and put in, and I know traveling, I'll put in something, Davis Street, and then they say to me, you know, where do you want to go? But then we can also have that link to our GPS system. And in, in, so it, that's coming better and more accurate. And um, uh, and I'm hoping that we're moving in that direction so that we don't have errors because there are people already many streets that are the same around uh, Ontario that, you know, they're there and they're not going to be changing. So I'm hoping that they're going to move to GPS coordinates and, and get us that way. <laughs> you know, if they say Prince Edward County, they'll GPS in on Prince Edward County, not Prince Edward Island, I'm hoping. <laughs> yes. No, I'm sure. Well, first of all, Prince Edward County exists in the state of Virginia. And I've been there oh, several yeah. times. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> and, I know. And that. the other one is uh, going down to Wapoose. When you cross the hill of Wapoose, you are in the United States on your phone. And yeah. I have no idea what they do for GPS down there. I've never been able to find anything that way. But well, I think that those things are going to be solved in the near future, and I'm I'm quite confident about that. Um, uh, so it so that it's good to talk with EMS and figure out what the system they're using now. And um, yeah, I know we have Glenwood Cemetery in the southern U.S., but it's quite clear when it comes back, Kentucky. So we this isn't here. <laughs> but anyway, okay. So thank you for that update. Um, any questions? Other questions for um, Jen? No. Okay, heritage permit uh, task team, and I'm going to go back to cemeteries. Heritage permit task team. You, there have been none came in, so I suspect they haven't met, right, Jen? Mm -hmm. They have not had to 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 work on any any of those issues yet. They'll probably have a, a bigger uptick in the spring when everybody's trying to get business per, building permits, right? <laughs> Save your energy for that time. Okay, <laughs> we will. All right. So the cemetery task team, um, and I and I wanted to um tell you what we what what we're trying to do. Um, and um, and based on the deputation that was coming to us about headstone restoration, I thought I should tell everybody on the committee and remind them that um, cemeteries do not own the headstones or markers. The headstones and markers are owned by the family. So some people think that that the cemeteries own them. We don't. So we even can't do anything to the headstone. If we must try to contact the family who owns it and get their permission. Even if a tree comes down and as it has done at Glenwood and it's wiped out a couple of uh, uh, headstones in the past, we have to leave them as that tree did it uh, and try to contact the family any remaining family members, current family members, uh, and if all else fails and we can't reach them, then we make the decision how to make them safe for the public and the site. So when we're looking at restoration, uh, uh, when we're the task team is going to be looking at that, what we will do with markers and, and headstones, we are guided by the provincial uh, regulations and consumer regulations, and and so we're gonna. I'm gonna circulate those uh, pertinent um, legislative and uh, regulations uh, out to uh, the task team, so that we understand what we have control of and what we don't. So, if your family owns the headstone, you the family has to be contacted. They make the decision whether you clean it whether you put it up, uh, write it up after it's been knocked over, they have, it's theirs. If we have, if it's a, what we call an orphan, 
headstone that there's no remaining family and we have, can't find any contacts for that family. Uh, like we, we often advertise on our website and say, is there anybody know of this family? Are they still around? The headstone is them damaged or we want to clean it or whatever. If we can't reach anybody in a reasonable period of time, then it comes back to the cemetery, uh, whether it's being monitored by the church or whether it's uh, monitored by a volunteer board or it's in the municipalities and care, then all we have to do is make sure that that headstone is not a danger to the uh, groundskeepers or people attending funerals that are there or who are visiting to look for genealogical information or to visit their relatives. So all our that's our responsibility. We are not obliged to uh, clean them, take the moss off them, put them up. It's only in the, in the view of how we will um, legally, we only have to make it safe. So I wanted you to understand that because it is, um, uh, somebody will come in and say, well, why haven't you taken the moss off this, this, this you know, beautiful headstone? It's the family's headstone. If they want a moss on it, <laughs> that's their choice or lichen um, and not mine. I mean, and so we are very, very careful to respect the wishes of the owners of the headstone and markers. Okay. Any questions about that? So uh, we we met again, our task team, and we, um, um, we were uh, working through um, some of the issues that we think we'll put into our, our, our master plan. And this issue of understanding the legislation so that we don't go off down a road that we can't be on. We, we don't write the legislation. It's there. We're just, you know, that, and we have to respect it and work around it. So I'm circulating for their homework, the uh, legislation uh, and the bylaws, because every cemetery has is allowed to, is, is required to write bylaws about their cemetery. So they're not all same from one to the other. The municipality has one set of bylaws that applies to all of their active cemeteries. Uh, and, um, and so those will be uh, applied to the active cemeteries where there are sales and purchases and burials. So we're going to circulate that information. If anybody out there wants to do some of the reading on that, I will uh, send it to Jen and she can circulate it to you um, because it is helpful and clarifies uh, some of the questions you might hear from the public. And then out after we get that, after that goes out, there'll be going out a list of things that we need to, we think we need to see addressed. And um, we are hopeful uh, and really would like to have public meetings as we go through that list of issues and concerns and things, policies that are being needed, that we, the public will give feedback to us on what, they're, what they would like to see uh, done. And, and then we can bring it back and talk about it here. So that's the kind of our plan. Uh, I, I, the education piece I'm going to put first. Uh, because um, I think it will be uh, uh, better, um, we'll get better discussions once all of us are on the same page knowing what we can and can't do. Yeah, so so if you're walking around Glenwood and you see some stone and in, in, in you just be assured that if it's, if it's a risk to, health, uh, to the safety of people, Glenwood will deal with it, um, but the families have to be contacted and, and sometimes we can't find them, but, and we know that from the 2018, um, vandalism, uh, many of the families don't exist anymore and we have no contact information and nobody does. We went out on the internet, we, on the internet and social media and we did find some families who responded, which was great in the United States and across Canada, but not many because they die out. So, so then we had to take them on and we adopted them as orphan monuments and we did get donors to help us deal with the safety issues with that, those monuments. Yes, John. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I, th I agree with you. I think the education piece is is most important, yeah. and and we really need to get something out ultimately for the public to understand yeah. because this is uh, many people greet this kind of information with disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. And they think that somehow the cemetery is responsible for everything, and, and that is absolutely you know not the case. And 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 uh, as you know, and this needs to come out too. We have we have more. Um, inactive cemeteries and active cemeteries in the yeah. county and pioneer cemeteries and so on. Yeah. And in some cases, uh, um, 
where nobody kind of knows where the stones belong and all the people are long gone. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, the Clapp Cemetery behind Liam McConnell's house in Milford. Um, the stones have just been nicely gathered kind of in a circle and you know there it is that's that's not where the bodies are um but it it's there's so many different things that can happen uh, or perhaps should happen and i think it's uh it, it would forestall a lot of questions and unhappiness if if we can uh, uh you know provide an education piece ultimately for the yeah. for the public so so good on you for spearheading this well it's it's um yeah i think you're right and and i'm I don't want to lose the information on any of the uh, headstones and markers. Um, markers, flat markers will sink into the ground eventually over many years. And this is another part of that, that then if we don't even have a picture of them before they sink in um, and we're not responsible for going in, the family's responsible for for making sure that if it's sinking in, that, that they hire someone to, 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 to put it back up in place. It's not, it's not us. And so um, if at least we can get pictures and really clear pictures of all of the um, um, headstones and markers and um, really thoroughly get those pictures established, that's one step that can be done. And um, we're starting it at Glenwood uh, of making sure. I know Find a Grave does has done some photographing and it's been great work, but we found that they tend to photograph only one side of the <laughs> headstone and we have headstones at glenwood that all down one side and if you walk around all down that side and we have some that are four-sided and there's everything on four sides so you need to really go and be thoroughly making pictures of every side of that monument and make sure that there's writing and then look at the ground and make everything of the markers because i've also found markers in, in one cemetery that uh, indicates the, the flat marker behind the family phone phone was a very a prominent uh, military uh, 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 ancestor. He's not buried there, but his marker was put there and it's on flat on the ground and it'll disappear. So, so we have to do better about documenting those markers and headstones and, um, uh, and because going forward, who knows what will happen. Um, if, if the family disappears, ceases to exist, nobody will be there for serving it. They will make it safe. Yes, Monica. So I'm curious because I'm involved with several other cemeteries, yep. not just here. Perpetual care, what you're describing for Glenwood is part of the bylaws that were created for Glenwood historically? That no, they are responsible no. for the stones? No, no. The, you, you see, the... Perpetual care, and I think some of the cemeteries, uh, like Glenwood, I think they have some perpetual care. And I think in 1925, I read one of the contracts there, it was like um, 50 cents for perpetual care or a dollar or two dollars. And I don't know what happened to those funds because they were not really managed well, Monica. Cemeteries uh, across Ontario and across Canada I, I think I lived in New Brunswick is the same problem there. They weren't uh, overseen by a central body or they did not, and they often did not have um, good um, management skills um, in how to manage the money and how to manage the, where the names would be preserved and all the bur burial records are very incomplete. It's a uh, dismal, but um, what we was established in 1956 here in Ontario was a care and maintenance fund. And that meant every time we sell a lot, a certain percentage of the money, the price of that lot goes into a care maintenance fund. It's a trust fund and only can be, you can't spend the trust fund mm -hmm. legally. You get can that. only get the interest. Okay. So, but the cemeteries, nobody watched the cemeteries a lot of the time. And some of them didn't bother putting the money in. If they were short operational money this year, well, they, they might not put any into their care and maintenance fund, they keep it out and, and put it on an operational cost. So that was kind of lax over a period of time. And now we have regulators, the uh, Bereavement Authority of Ontario, um, and they've been um, given the task of uh, implementing the regulations and, and legislation. And they really watch how they want every year, you're supposed to report how many lots you sell, how many monuments come in and, and the money and, and keep track of it. They 
have we still have i think over 200 cemeteries somewhere in the in the in, uh, ontario that that don't do don't follow those rules we've had cemeteries where suddenly the care and maintenance fund was spent on building a i don't know a, a garage for somebody uh and 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 over the years it it just had had to be tightened up and they are tightening up so so sometimes when a cemetery will be turned over to the municipality, its care and maintenance fund might be, you know, six thousand dollars. Well, what's the interest on six thousand dollars? It won't even even get you to have this one couple one snow blowing if you had to get in there somewhere, or it's not even going to cover the grass cutting. So all that care and maintenance fund, the interest out of it is there to maintain the cemetery, and um, if they didn't pay in, or was spotty in paying in then that fund is very low. There's not much interest coming out. It's not enough to operate the cemetery. It's not enough to cut the trees down that are trees there or cut your grass or weed whip around the stones. There's not enough to do anything. And that's been um, a problem. And, and it's a problem across Canada and in the U.S. Uh, it's not just our problem, but it's just been that way. And um, so, so some cemeteries uh are have lots of money others have zero we get some that it has nothing comes with it because if they were there before 1956 they so were obligated to have that but even some later ones are not doing well so so we're left with it and that's why it's so important for us to understand how we're going to manage this because we're not getting you know the, the, they're, they're, we're, we inherit problems we inherit yeah, the problems of the dead rotting trees uh, and no money in the pot to take them down. We inherit monuments that were installed incorrectly and on on poor foundations and they're tipping over and they are a threat to people going in. What do we do about those? So we have, it, it's a huge issue and people don't understand that the, really the money hasn't been, been there. Some are good, but not, not others. Monica, you have another question. But that I knew most of that stuff, Sandy. But I, what I, what I was asking was, if if we were installing a monument tomorrow yep. or today, and it's in a spot where there's sand, Glenwood's a good one because of the water and all that kind of stuff. And the hills. We were installing a, a monument, and ten years from now, yep. that monument, that flat to the ground stone, was sinking. Who's responsible okay. for raising that up? Okay. So you're talking going forward. And unfortunately, most of the monuments that will uh, have been put in in the past, they're, they're the ones that give us trouble. Because our bylaws contain very specific regulations that we insist on forcing on how that foundation is going to go in. So... It, when we say we want it four feet deep, we want it four feet deep and X wide and flanged at the bottom. We've talked with engineers and, and it better be done that way or it, you're going to dig it up, whoever puts it in uh, and redo it. And because we've been that's that's how much we're concerned about liability and uh, for going forward. So we ensure that, that it goes in by our standards and uh, the monument company standards. And and so then that we lower the risk of anything happening going forward. It won't be shifting from frost on the side hill. It won't be pushed up by the frost. So um, that's what we do. So we insist on a flat marker when it goes in. We tell the family that there's a certain way we want to go it to go in, and and we require them to to follow that to do that, so it won't sink as far. You can't prevent sinking all the time unless you really go deep, and we tell you that. But the flat markers are uh, we're, we found a system that we think will work and for a better term. Also, we ask the family to have insurance, so that if for vandalism insurance uh, on it, that they take the insurance on it. If, uh, and then then that can uh, go into the records and we can come back. One monument company offers a long term insurance policy for that. And we think that and we advise them that you you need to have that because going forward, if you really want it to be there, helping trying to protect the taxpayer from it, if Glenn, whatever gets turned over to the county to to deal with. Then we have tried in all the monuments and markers going forward. We've tried to protect 
uh, you from that long-term maintenance problem. It's the monuments and headstones uh, that have uh, been put in in the past that are our biggest problem. Not the ones in 1863. Those uh, men that put those in knew about rubble stone construction and they knew to put it down four feet deep because we've had to dig some of them out when uh, they were disturbed by a tree falling on them. And they are really well built. But by today's standards, we have to replace that with uh, concrete. And uh, uh, and so anyway, we know they're good, but it's that period of time where people didn't want to pay much and they thought they could do it cheaper and who oversees it. We actually have inspect the monument uh, foundations uh, when they go in, our staff, because that's how strongly we our board feels on doing it right the first time, because we don't want to be liable, because we would be liable if it if it does so so that going forward but when we have all these cemeteries where they've been in before we don't know right yeah. and yeah so so that is how it's going to be coming back to us on that but every time a headstone monument or a marker goes in there they pay a percentage to the care and maintenance fund okay. but it isn't huge money but it goes in there um at, at, and helps build the fund up thanks that's fine yeah okay any more questions so and in the green burial area, you're not allowed any headstones or markers. So at and another, just one more little point in in the United States, in new cemeteries in the United States here in Canada too, they are not. Some of them are not allowing above ground uh, headstones and monuments. They are insisting on flat markers, and that's it. Not pillow markers, flat markers nothing else um and uh, some won't even allow little spike things for the uh, plant flower the whole flowers they want it maintenance as maintenance uh, easy maintenance as possible and re reduce completely the liability of uh, monuments tipping over on anybody so those are the kinds of things that that we'll bring forward and talk about with the community how do you see this going forward in our community we are not creating cemeteries here right now we have enough um so we have enough land, I think, uh, allocated at the moment, but you should plan for it in the future. Um, and uh, so we will um, um, talk about that. So, all right. Thank you for to hearing me out. It's a complicated. Uh, it's more complicated than people think. <laughs> so um, then we have a motion to... Uh, have uh, the updates, verbal updates from the uh, working uh, committees, the working groups and task teams. Yes, thank you, Monica. Seconded John Hirsch. Very good, thank you. Everybody's in favor. Okay, so work plan. And on the top of that list is the uh, museum storage update. And Chris is probably has knows more about cemeteries now than he ever thought he'd know. <laughs> we have a few on our property, so it's great yes. to know that actually. <laughs> thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. I just want to say a very brief thing on the public art planning uh, side of things as well for, for Andrea and, that, and particularly to highlight the importance of this committee uh, in that, in the relationship to getting that where we want it to go. And that's where we do want it to go as Councilor Hirsch mentioned staff and council everybody are trying to get sort of a proactive planned approach to things uh, the cultural heritage master plan will be coming soon and we're working with them closely on the public art planning process with county arts and uh, establishing that and getting that where we want it to be is very very important uh, for the health of the community not only economically but also uh, just as far as mental health for folks that are in the area we've learned that public art is very uh can be very empowering for people, uh, especially if it's placed in hospital areas or long-term care facilities, things like that. Uh, but as uh, Councillor Hirsch mentioned, it does require uh, some teeth. It, it, we're probably going to talk to bylaws and things like that or create a few to help that process along. Uh, and that's gonna be, uh, we, we certainly discovered in the early stages of researching that there were only really two contacts for the community in Prince Edward County regarding public art. And they were either calling uh, P hack at the time or built now or county arts. Uh, so that's why we, we do feel very strongly that it's super important to work with you folks on that to get uh, 
the guidelines established the plan and the process are key, but they are guidelines. Uh, we do require something to implement the guidelines and the program is what would do that in conjunction as Councillor Hirsch said with some with some bylaws that put things in place that uh, can speak to infractions and perhaps some some fees that would help fund that program through that. Uh, but also to invest in public art and have artists uh, available to come and work in the community so that uh, we're already known as an artist's community, but we're not known publicly for that. We're known, a lot of private sector is is very good at uh, promoting that, but we want to do the same thing publicly because we've we've seen the value in communities that do it well. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. Okay. And then with regard to the collections and storage update, I can share uh, Liz's report that she drafted for us, which I think she did an excellent job of on our screen. And it was sent along to you earlier, so hopefully you've been, had a chance to take a look at that. So just to give you a little background on this, uh, when I first started, it was September of 2021 uh, that, that I came to the museum uh, portfolio. And at that time, uh, our advisory board was the museum advisory board, which was made up of a lot of folks on this board. Uh, and it got amalgamated into uh, what it is currently with you guys at Bill. And when I first arrived, it took a little while to get our feet under the ground and take a look at things and see where we were. But one of the, the areas that we identified, my director and, and I, uh, Lisa Lindsay, was uh, the collections and inventory management. So at that time, the recommendation from leadership in the museums was to create a large storage facility and take all of what we had in the collections and put it in that facility and then sort and deal with it. Personally, uh, at that point in time, I didn't like that plan. I think that we should have sorted and dealt with the items that we had in the collections uh, before we arranged storage, because how did we know the size of the storage? How did we know the concerns that we need to need to have in the storage facilities? And we also discovered that storage is a concern for several different uh, departments in the municipality, the libraries, archives, everybody needs storage. So the idea would be to amalgamate storage for all of those bodies so that we were working in one facility and how we could make that work for everyone. And to do that effectively, I believe, and, and Lisa believed as well, that we needed to take a proper inventory of what we had in the museums at the time. Uh, and to do that, we required staff. Uh, that was right after the end of COVID, so we were very short. It was basically just Jessica and I and Janice working part-time at that stage. So we didn't actually have a collections person of any kind. It was just fell to the curatorial staff. And to give you an idea where we were, Macaulay is certainly our, our most well-organized museum, but the upper level of the church at Macaulay had items that were donated from folks from 2012, and this is in 2021 that hadn't been accessioned and that hadn't been followed through with. And part of that's COVID and part of that's shortage of staff and part of that's just mismanagement, I think. Uh, so what we did was identify a program to get some staff. And how we did that was we began very aggressive community engagements. So we really started doing a lot of events. We started doing uh, a lot of activities at the museum to get folks in, to show people that there was some value in the museums. Uh, we think that we've, we did that. Uh, and as a result of that, by the summer of 22, we were able to hire two part-time people and one full-time person. Uh, Georgia Papanicolo, who does our social media and marketing components. Uh, Cassandra Walden, uh, who's on mat leave now in Graydon's in this role, Graydon McConnell. But that's the uh, volunteer and education role. And then most importantly for this talk, uh, Elizabeth Fennell, or Liz, as she likes to be called, uh, who is our collections and exhibit development person. And she worked with the museums earlier uh, in 2019, I believe, as a contract person and did a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, inventory engagement at specifically at Macaulay. So she was quite aware of the collection and she had a lot of the work that she had finished in 29 was 2019 was still sitting where she had left it. So she was able to pick that up very, very quickly. Uh, and she's been extremely effective in her role uh, as with regard to an inventory, which I think you'll see here uh, in her report, what she's been able to achieve in a short period of time. It is a little daunting. Uh, you'll see that she's noted that there's about 20,000 inventoried items uh, in our collection. And when she says that in the breakdown, those are items that are actually cataloged somewhere. 
my guess is we're probably close to about 50,000 or 40,000 items uh, with a lot of those items not cataloged <laughs> or not accounted for at five different sites and she's in a part-time role. So uh, you can imagine that some days she's, uh, it's a lot for her to look at and be like, where do I start? But we basically had her start uh, one museum at a time. So you'll see here a little breakdown of, of her, uh, just an experience and where she's been at. Uh, and just to give you an idea of where she started uh, with uh, her education and with what she wanted to tackle first, museums. And what we did was develop a plan around some grant uh, funding that we were able to receive through a digitization strategy through the Department of Canadian Heritage and the uh, MAP program. And that's going to help us digitize or have an effective plan toward digitization of all of the county collections, which helped provide her with a little guideline about how she wanted to catalog and inventory. So in doing that, we, we went along to each of the museums and identified areas where artifacts or donated materials were in danger. Uh, for example, as she's noted in here at Rose House, we had uh, a fair amount of quilts in storage in the upper level of Rose House. The upper level of Rose House is, is readily accessible by, by rodents. Uh, it's certainly weatherproof to a degree, but there are some, some concerns and some issues that are there. And for anything that's fabric or textile, it's a very dangerous spot for storage. So we went to all the museums and identified each of those particular sections. Then Liz went into each of our storage areas uh, and identified what needed to go where. So she was able to say, well, we don't want to store quilts in a space where there's rodent access, where there's not proper HVAC. But we do have those things at Macaulay and the church upstairs. And there are some materials there like wooden spinning wheels or uh, wooden boxes that could be stored at Rose House. And OK, let's let's take a look at, and plan. Let's move those to there and let's take the Rose House quilts and move them to Macaulay. Part of that is just an example of the five museums coming together as uh, the county museums. So each collection isn't so much specific to us, an actual museum but that it's reflective of all five county museums and we're able to use storage uh, where it's necessary at each museum for items that require it. So if you need an HVAC uh, system to store something that's particularly a rose, in, uh, a rose artifact, we're still gonna keep it at Macaulay unless it's on display at Rose. And Liz is tracking that and keeping meticulous notes on all of that, usually through a system called Pass Perfect, which is a software uh, that a lot of museums use. Uh, we've had a lot of challenges with that and its integration with our uh, IT system and how our servers work. So we've uh, identified in the digitization strategy a potential change to that. And Liz is uh, investigating different options that might be useful for that. Um, you can see on the next page here, her largest achievement this year, which was the Wellington Heritage Museum project. And for this, we received uh, grant funding, as she's uh, noted here, $5,000 to support this project. This was the upper level. You can see the photos here uh, of the Wellington Museum. It was jam packed with uh, artifacts. It was also mixed and mingled with all sorts of different things that weren't artifacts like craft supplies or programming supplies or signage, uh, or sometimes just personal items that were left from other people uh, that were mixed in with artifacts. And what Liz did was go in there, take a very careful inventory of what was in that space. And then we uh, closed the museum for a couple of weeks and she staged the whole downstairs area with tables and chairs, recruited a, a team of volunteers that she was very successful with getting, uh, most of whom had some expertise either in archivals or, photo or photography or areas uh, like quilts. And they came and assessed each of the individual items, photographed them, uh, inventoried them, and then Liz determined where they needed to go. So they were staying in Wellington, they were moving to Ameliasburg, as many of the, of the items did, uh, or they went to an HVAC storage uh, space that's usually at Macaulay when we do things like that. So that gives you an idea. And that the timeline for that, as she's noticed in here, is most of the spring and summer, it took her to get through what you see in this picture. There's also about twice of that in the basement of Wellington as well that we've identified. 
Uh, and what what gives us a little bit of a challenging, but it's also an exciting challenge is in the process of doing this, Liz will inevitably discover some pretty unique artifacts. And then what we do, because we don't want to be closed all the time, we're trying to be open five days a week at all the museums uh, with the seasonal two in the summer from May till September. But when we find something and we get excited by, by it, as she did with uh, uh, particularly a wedding dress that she found in Macaulay, she built a whole exhibit around that. So that took her a little bit of time. Uh, Jessica, our curator, also helped us helped her with that. And then we mounted that exhibit at uh, Macaulay and also at Wellington. Uh, and we're finding that that's basically the process. So she'll basically go in and review each of our sites. Some of our sites, like in Aliasburg, have 39 to 40 buildings. And she'll inventory a section. And if she readily identifies something exciting in that section, there's many exciting items. But if she's like, I, I've got an idea for an exhibit on this, and we're in the busier seasons, or we're at a point where we need to recycle or re change over our exhibit, she'll stop that process and help develop an exhibit. And we'll launch the exhibit that will hopefully bring a few uh, interested parties through the museum. And also in that process, recruit some volunteers. That was certainly the case with uh, So Went the Summer and our quilt exhibit. A lot of the quilters that we have uh, through our volunteer program now came through the Quilting Guild, uh, but they were absolutely essential in uh, all those Rose House quilts getting repaired, uh, their def whatever defects were there addressed and uh, outlined, and uh, a plan being made for their conservation. We don't have a conservation person, so Liz has got some expertise in that, so we do do that. But uh, in the process of this as well, she's managed to partner up with the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa, and we've done a few program initiatives with them, particularly around uh, an H.J. McFarland secretary box that has uh, that Liz identified in her original contract needed care, hadn't received any care, so when she started back up with us, she picked that up and sent and, uh, her and uh, one of our physical properties folks took that up to Ottawa. And that group is working on that uh, for us now. And they're really great partners because they don't charge us. So it's a, it's an educational program. So they do all the work for us and we sort of map it and we're going to do an exhibit around it. Uh, but they don't charge us uh, for their time and expertise. Uh, we just provide them with the, uh, with the pieces. And on this, on this page, you'll see what she's got identified as our current artifact recorded records. And this can be paper or computer. This is what she's been able to do with regard to each location and where she's at from the 2016 period. And then you'll see again that she's got the 1893 artifacts uh, that are professionally digital photographed and are ready for public use. The majority of those, not all of them, but the majority of those came from that Wellington project that she was able to, to complete through some grant funding and certainly with a lot of volunteer man hours. And there's a little bit of a breakdown of site by site here too of each of the different artifacts and where they're contained at each individual location. And here she's uh, she's highlighted some long-term goals. Uh, we've spoken about this fairly aggressively because we always knew that for Liz, it was gonna be a three to five year plan to get her where we needed to be. I think a five year plan's uh, more appropriate. A year per museum seems uh, reflective specifically because at Mariners and Rose, you can't work there in the winter. There's no uh, washroom facilities and it's extremely cold. Uh, but she's, she's very positive. Uh, and she certainly started out, I think a little less positive, but she's really, uh, with her progress and what she's been able to achieve, she's she's really uh, become quite positive on what she's going to be able to do with the collection. Uh, we're trying to provide her as much staff support as well as we can to, to do this, but she's really turned a lot to volunteer support. Uh, we have people like uh, Gabby, who's drawing a lot of the artifacts out for us. Jackie's helped. Uh, I, Jackie's probably worked as many hours as Liz toward this project on a volunteer level. Uh, Larry did a lot of a lot of photos for us at that particular location in Wellington. Uh, so she's quite positive. The idea is that we'll be able to get some digitization in place and and get at least those twenty thousand artifacts that are already uh, recorded either on paper or on the computer available to the public through our uh, our website. And that's another area of, of uh, concern that we've addressed. The website for the county is where we're hosted. And it, it's not ideal for our needs, for the, muse for the museum needs. It works well for the municipality, but as a, as a hub for what we're trying to do 
it's a little bit limited. So we're working with IT and Mark uh, Kerr from communications, uh, hopefully in the longer term to develop a, a county museum website that might be dedicated to these things so that folks can actually go on there, search uh, an item, an individual, and actually look at all the different materials that are available. Uh, that's something that you can see done fairly well at Gla at, uh, at uh, the Glanmore House in Belleville. Uh, Kingston does a, a fairly good job of that as well. Uh, so we'd like to emulate a little bit of that with the five county museums. Again, not separated per museum, but as a, the county museums as a whole. And once we have the digitization strategy in place that I, I mentioned that we have funding again for, that's uh, that's we received a little over 6,000 to develop that. Once we have that in place, that'll open a lot of doors for more funding opportunities. Most of this you cannot do, you can't apply for many of the inventory and digitization uh, grants if you do not have a digitization strategy. So step one was to make that, get that strategy in place and we're close to getting that there. And that was again, grant funded. And then we'll be able to apply for a few more things, but we do keep an eye out for things like the Wellington Heritage Museum move where Liz was able to procure that 5,000. It wasn't all that she hoped, but it was still a huge help. And because we have volunteer uh, efforts, it, the cost was minimal uh, in that regard. She, she'd really like to improve some of the storage, uh, dis either display cases or storage facilities, not the actual space, but the areas where we actually store things. So have doors that close. Uh, there are some climate controlled units that that uh, we'd like for some of our materials because we do readily identify things that really need that. Uh, for instance, at Mariners recently, there's some old fire grenades out there that are extremely interesting, but also contain, you know, fairly dangerous chemicals. And, and were that glass to break, it wouldn't be ideal. So those are things that we'd like to have on display or in storage, but need to be in very secure secure uh, and, and controlled environments, uh, preferably ones that for that one, even though it's quite safe in the glass, I prefer that they weren't at Mariners where the, where the temperature can fluctuate between, you know, minus 20 and plus 20. Uh, I'd like to have that in a secured, a secured location, but it's also about finding out what we have in the collection. And uh, we have some understanding of that right now but it's not where we need to be to go straight to let's build a giant storage facility. We're, we're at the stage where let's see what we've got. Let's see what's damaged beyond the point of repair. Let's uh, for the museums, we are able to either uh, sell items as long as it goes back towards the collection. That's a key component that's at, in museums. You're not, you're not able to just sell things willy nilly. You have to actually speak to the donors, uh, you're able to work with other museums, but you are able to fund uh, collections related and inventory projects through the sale of items. Uh, we're not saying that we're gonna do that, but we'd like to assess the collection and see where those items might be uh, might be an option. We also have a lot of duplicates in the collection where we have upwards of 10 of the same items. So identifying those and saying, well, let's keep three of these and these other seven items might be able to go to other museums that have helped us in the past. So I would say we're probably about two to three years from getting to a place where we can readily identify excess storage beyond what we already have uh, for more materials. And in that timeline, we plan to continue to work with archives and uh, other county departments that also require additional storage so that we can just maximize the taxpayers' dollars. We don't, we don't want to be spending things where we don't need to be spending things. And certainly Liz came from the world where she thought that doing that going storage first and then assessing the collection was the way to go but she's come around uh totally on that so after reviewing the collection she's like no i i think that i need to really take a look at what we've got and i think there's uh, a lot of items that need some attention and some care but we, we need to go through our collection and get a better understanding of, of where we are at And there's a little bit of a brainstorm wish list she wanted me to share just because she always likes to share some of her ideas in hopes that somebody might say, hey, we've got some some funding opportunities for that. Or maybe there's a partnership involved. And these are all great ideas. We've chatted about this quite a bit. Uh, we've worked with Marilyn Adams uh, as well. They have a lot of some of the they don't have a 3D printer, but they do have some some uh, archival uh, cameras and printing materials that we would be able to use to help digitize. And they're quite open to partnerships. So we like to see. Uh, some more engagement with the other uh, heritage and culture related uh, companies and communities in our in our 
in our region to work together, uh, again, to minimize uh, taxpayer dollars, but to maximize what we're able to do. Okay, thank you. I think that's been a great uh, presentation, Chris, and brought us up to speed on that. Um, the storage facility has been on the uh, agenda over many of the uh, <laughs> museum <laughs> committee uh, as a pro committees that I've served on, advisory committees. So I'm glad to see that we're moving forward and um, um, uh, and have getting at least the collection itemized and know what we have and then well what we really need in, in detail. That's very good. Thank you. Any uh, comments or questions from the rest of the committee? Uh, yes, John, you're on mute. Uh, well, so good. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sandy. And and thank you, Chris. What a great um, explanation. I mean, this is this is such important work retaining uh, and recording the history. You know, all the documents, and it's an awful lot of work. I'm glad to see that you're having some success getting grant money and volunteers, and and this continues. But question I have for you is, what what role does does um, museums play in collecting, or could museums play in collecting oral history? I ask that because. Um, there are a lot of uh, old timers in the county that have fabulous stories to tell, and I find we're not capturing that. And um, some some of it has been done, but you may not even have copies of things like this uh, in Milford. When the uh, and Monica will remember this, uh, the two hundredth anniversary of Milford, I guess, was it two thousand eight? Um, interviews were done with some folks, most of whom are now gone. Uh, and, and Bruce Dowdell uh, recorded videos and captured these stories. But there's all kinds of other people around who are aging, who have tremendous uh, recollection of, of events that need to be captured. So is there a role for, a role for museums in that? Or how should we go at that? I don't know. I think absolutely there's a role for us there. So I can speak to our most, our newest exhibits. We've built that in. So in the... Uh, uh, the, in the example of uh, Path Forward, which is our project with the Downey Wenjack Fund and uh, Dijuna Angawana, the Tainanaga Language and Cultural Center, uh, and we have 14 Indigenous artists, for that, we've, uh, we applied to a, a digital grant that included, and there's, there's two grants you can do uh, to support these, to, the oral histories, particularly if it's e either literally oral by audio or uh, video component that's an accessibility grant because it reduces all the barriers. So people that aren't able to come physically to the sites are able to still uh, participate. And that's again, where our website really can't facilitate the storage required for those items. Uh, so that that's an identified place, but we've got, we had a, we had a tremendous grant from the department of Canadian heritage for, for a path forward uh, on those components, a $90,000 grant. And we're working with a production, an indigenous production uh, crew, and web developer who is going to do uh, video with an audio component that will be able to be separated as well for all of our artists and for all of the people that are involved in the exhibit who have uh, living relatives uh, or for those that went to residential schools who wanna record their story, some of whom we might not share publicly, but we're gonna archive, uh, particularly for our partners at TTO, so long as they're, uh, open to doing that, which we've discussed with them. So whether it's all public for that particular exhibit or not, we don't know, but we want to secure the archival footage. And then we have uh, for the Arrow Trail that we've just launched, we we're doing the same thing. So we have some support from RTO9 and we've applied for two other grants that would support the oral history of the Raise the Arrow campaign by uh, that would hopefully include a tour, both audio and video, uh, with John Brzezinski and uh, Dr. Richard Main from the Royal Canadian Air Force that would actually do exactly what you're saying, Councillor Hirsch, and have that incorporated into the current exhibit. Where that wasn't done in previous exhibits, uh, that's something we want to go back through our records, and it's something that Liz has identified as well. Uh, we have people like uh, very long-term serving volunteers in the case of... Uh, Don and Nancy at the Macaulay House. These are folks that have been at that house for over 30 years. Uh, we have a few people that are like that. And in chatting with them, uh, I said, well, there's no 
particularly that Macaulay House, exhibit about the Bond family, who were the family that lived there in the 70s. Jane is someone that, like, Jane is a Bond and currently does all of our garden work there. But there's no history on her in the actual museum. Well, Don opened up a drawer, and in that drawer was interviews that he had conducted with uh, <clears throat> members of the Bond family himself as a volunteer that are wonderful. They're all, and he's, hand, he's, he's transcribed them all. They're all existing there. But nothing's been done to share that with the community uh, and nothing's been done to get that on an audio or uh, an oral setting uh, for people to share. And that's something we really want to work towards. We're, we're starting it. All of our exhibits that move forward will have that component. So every exhibit we build will have a video component and an audio component. So even if the exhibit comes down, it'll still exist in an audio and video form. And then what we want to do is assess some of the successful exhibits from the past that the museums have done over the many decades they've been around and see if we're able to do the same thing. Because it's not only the, the histories that we're losing to a degree, but certainly for us, uh, and I think it's the same for all community groups, a lot of our volunteer groups who are absolutely essential to a visitor experience at the museums, without them, the visitor experience is just not what it could be. Um, you can picture Amelia'sburg Heritage Village with no volunteers. So you walk in and it's a ghost village. If you walk in when all the volunteers are there, you've got uh, the people in the log cabin, you've got a blacksmith, uh, you've got someone at the general store and it comes alive. Mm -hmm. And we need to preserve that as much as possible. Right now, funding wise, we don't have enough in our operational budget to get there. Uh, and we haven't identified enough things to actually put that in the operational budget. But where we do see a lot of support is through accessible grants that are allowing us to do things like that, not only for, for folks uh, that are just coming to enjoy the exhibits, but also for people that aren't able to either show up at the space or don't have access to some of our tours. For instance, Jess's Graves and Gallows tour, she takes everybody around the gravestones and they go up the stairs at the courthouse to where the hanging occurred. And that's not a that's not a trip that can be readily made by anybody with any walking impediments. Yeah. So even with that, we've recorded uh, eight virtual tours uh, that will will probably be ready by early January. Most of them are in post production already. That share those stories uh, again, largely through a curatorial perspective, and we have some volunteer perspectives. But we really like to engage the community to get the stories that you're talking about, Councillor Hirsch, and that's uh, that's something we identified quite early. Because uh, none of us, without disparaging other museums, we don't like the dramatized stories where you can go to some museums and, and you can hear a dramatized version of the story, but it's not from people that were actually there. And that's okay if, if that's all you can do. But I think in the county, we still have a lot of people available to share a lot of stories. Where we could use some assistance uh, with that is uh, identifying those folks, uh, and and sometimes they're a little hesitant to get on the record uh, with things when you put the video camera up. So we'd love to do that uh, as much as possible. And Past Perfect and another program that Liz is working on actually has a uh, audio component where you can just speak into it and it will translate very very effectively. Uh, and as well as into French. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll be able to develop those skills, but it's it's very much identified as something that we need to do. And it's very important that the museums do it because that that is definitely the mandate of the museums is to preserve those stories. Just a quick follow-up, Sandy, if I could. Yeah. That's that's great, Chris. I think, um, uh, you know, these people are fading away and we need, it, it's, it's a, an important thing to do on a timely basis. Um, you may be aware, I'm not sure if the committee is, the rest of the committee, but SSJI through um, uh, primarily at the urging of Amy Bodman, uh, Amy's been interviewing um, uh, the old Fisher families, so McCormick's and, and Rorabeck's and so on in the South Shore um, to, to uh, document the stories of the, of the fishery as far back as, as they can go, uh, because it, it's, it seems to be um uh not well enough known um you know component of of county history and ongoing too as we know from some of the recent events i mean the fishery is still alive um and, and that's going to become a book you know and amy we we've we've um, we've gotten grants to hire summer students to actually do the transcription it's one thing to to record it in a you know in a whole afternoon of interview but then you've got to transcribe it and kind of 
grammatically correct it and stuff. It's um, it's great work, but it can be costly. And and um, um, the more that we can do for other stories, that's just one. Uh, I think I think the better. Any other from the committee? No. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I. Have you talked with Krista Richardson? Because there was a project about 10 or 12 years ago that recorded the uh, audio uh, interviews with the women of Wellington. Um, they got a special grant for it and they uh, transcribed it. And uh, so there are copies of that in, in there. Um, and there are quite a few um, stories, uh, documentation, of course, in her archives, uh, because that's the archives that that uh, the Historical Society uh, started in many years ago. So there's a lot of the background documentation um, families and Chris is trying to, she's got a lot of materials there and it, there a lot of hidden, hidden gems of, of, um, of not only photographs, but stories of the people that have not been, they, again, no funding, not enough staff to get it out. And so I think it would be good if you could partner well with her on that one. I think they were all women that they um, uh, did in that, that presentation of, of settling in Wellington. So that was, uh, um, so that would be, uh, that might be interesting to get. And I, it's, I've seen the transcripts of some of them, but they're not, you know, they need to be more pulled together like you're doing on, on that. Yeah. And building back the background. Okay. So, um, if there are no more questions or comments, I'll need um, a motion to receive uh, the committee's discussion on the work, uh, our work plan on uh, and and Chris's presentation or verbal presentation uh, um, be received. So yes, our John moves and Michael uh, seconds. So everybody's in favor. <clears throat> Good. All right. So um, if there's nothing more, we can look at the January date. Remind you of that. January 10th, 2024. Uh, it's been a long meeting, but we did have to catch up on a lot of activities. We're a busy, productive committee, and uh, and uh, you can't just cover that in five minutes. So, uh, yes, uh, Councillor Hurst. Thanks, Sandy. Oops, you're muted. There. Me there. Thank you. Um, just one item back on the work plan, just maybe before we okay. move, move on, just uh, sure. I have a, a useful update, I think. Okay. Uh, and that's the highlighted item on on enforcement measures. We've been after, yes. uh, we've been after the county to um, uh, come and present to us about uh, what we could do in the way of enforcement of heritage permits. And um, I can tell everybody that Aaron McNichol, who is responsible for, for bylaw, um, convene a meeting with himself and Mike Kelly, who is his supervisor, uh, Mike Michaud from Planning and Sarah Vio, the new county lawyer. And um, uh, it, it's been confirmed that there is currently, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, there is no legal ability to, to do any enforcement. It would require a county bylaw. So Aaron says that he has tasked Mike Kelly with preparing a comprehensive report to come to us uh, for consideration. Uh, after they consult with various other county departments involved, and would February or March work? And I'm inclined to respond. I think we should respond. Well, February would work yeah. better than March. Uh, yeah. The sooner we get at this, the better. So um, that's just an update, I guess. Yeah. So maybe we revise that work plan, uh, Jen, so that um, uh, Mike Kelly is now shown for February, yeah. uh, the February meeting. I can do that. Um, we should do a motion to update the work plan. Um, okay. So I'll do that. Let's see. Uh, that work plan be updated to um, include the presentation yeah. by bylaw in February, in the February meeting. So moved by Councillor Hirsch. Yep. 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 And seconder. Thank you, Ross. And everyone's okay with that? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Everybody's. Yep. Perfect. All right. So is that, uh, that's all our business. Jen, you've got nothing else to, I think the work plan is we've, we've covered every, 
item in there that now that uh, I think we, we need to look at. So mm -hmm. can I have a motion to adjourn? All right, Ross, thank you. Second, Michael, thank you. Everybody have a safe and happy Christmas. It's snowing at my house now. Uh, <laughs> so Not here. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> uh, well, that's what happened. I live in the north end of the county. It is snowing there here. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Merry Take care.